Det er spadder, ja. Det er live. Ja. Lad mig double check. Oh, I see that Alex, you just joined. Yeah, I opened on my computer. <laughs> It's so weird to see it. Okay, shall we start? Ken? Yeah. Okay. Ken? okay, great. All right, uh, so good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this Saturday morning to kick off this first session of Online with the Pros uh, organized by the Band Directors Association Singapore. So we hope uh, everyone is really holding up well in the midst of such uh, unprecedented times. So to start things off for this session, uh, we are very happy to feature instrumentalists from the French horn section with three of Singapore's very well-loved French horn players. So without much further, <laughs> I will leave them to introduce themselves. Uh, Louis? Okay. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Louis and uh, I'm currently serving the Singapore Armed Forces Band and uh, I'm holding on the position of a principal horn player. So. Just yes, uh, last year I just finished my NAFA studies. Uh, uh it's been sponsored uh, sponsored by SAF. So yeah, this is a short little profile of me. Maybe next one. Uh, hello. Hello, I'm Alex. Um, <laughs> I'm a horn player. Uh, currently I'm well. Technically, I'm so I'm still. Principal Horn of Sun Symphony Orchestra in Hanoi, but because of COVID situation, so now I'm back in Singapore. Um, yeah, I studied mostly in Singapore. I did two years of masters in UK at the Royal College of Music. Yeah, and then after that I moved to Vietnam, and now I'm back in Singapore for this time being, at least. All right, Christopher. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's having this morning voice thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm Christopher. I obviously I played a horn at uh yeah Singapore Armed Forces Central Band. Um, that's my job. Uh, I just finished my degree from NAFA in collaboration with uh, Royal College of Music London about three years ago, and ever since then I'm back at the uh, Singapore Armed Forces Band and I teach around and do gigs sometimes here and there. So that's that's about that's about it. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. All right. Thank you for the introduction. So for all of those who are just joining us, right? Welcome again to online. With the so prior to this session, we have been inviting you guys to actually send in your questions. And on our hands, we do have some questions that you would like for our pros here to answer. Um. So uh, for those who have yet to submit your questions, right? please continue to send in all your horn-related questions into the comments section over on Facebook and we'll try as much as possible to get it answered. 
Right, so on my hand, I have this question actually submitted earlier by uh, someone called Maya. So Maya is asking how to improve uh, on tonality. Maybe Alex can share this a little bit more with us. When, they, when the question is asked like tonality, does she mean tone? Because uh, I think if we're, yeah, if we're talking about definition, tonality and tone are two completely different things. So I'm just going to assume that she's asking on improving tone. So before I talk about tone, I'm just going to give a quick definition. Tonality is nothing related to tone. It's talking about the key structure, the structure of the key signature of the, of the piece. That is a, the tonal center is like, you know, key signatures, all that side. Tonality and tone is not related. So back to the question where she's asking about how to improve tone. Um, for me, the main things that I, I do to make sure I get the sound I want is I, I always, always listen to a lot, a lot of professional recordings of world famous horn players, be it solo or chamber or even just orchestra excerpts or even, even listening to orchestras. That's number one. Why do I do this? Is so that I can get a really clear, clear idea of what kind of sound I like, what kind of sound I want to make. And you know what I mean? So that's number one. Number two, for me, improving sound is all about experimenting. Experimenting in the sense that like, maybe if you're not satisfied with your current sound because it's too tight, you can always experiment with a little bit of like aperture widening and a little bit more relaxed breathing just experimenting on your own time because there's a teacher can only show you so much, mm. but a lot of it happens within yourself. Like you know exactly what's happening inside the best. And then the third thing is recording yourself. Record yourself, record yourself, invest in a high quality Zoom recorder, not Zoom video call app, but Zoom video audio recorder device. Wait, wait, I go and get, I, I have. Yeah, actually, if this, I have one right here. This, this kind. Sorry, Lewis. <laughs> ah, yeah, but this kind, yeah. okay? You use it in your practice, you use it in your... This also can, actually. Yeah. yeah it's, all, it's all any kind, you know? And if... Because handphone, iPad, you know, you can't really hear the clear sound. But recording yourself, you exactly know what other people are hearing because as horn players, right, the bell is not exactly pointing towards our ear. <laughs> so sometimes what we hear is not what your audience hear. Yes. Yeah. So improving tone, these are my three main three main points. Yeah. So Luis, Christopher, do you have any uh, point of view on this as well? Mm. How do I improve tone? Yeah. I feel improving tone has got to be like what Alex say, mostly about here and the ears. You have to know what you want. And like what Alex mentioned earlier, you have to listen to lots of recordings and uh, know what you want to sound like. That's the first most important thing is to have a perception of what you want to sound like. And then the rest is just really trial and error and practicing. Uh, also with the recorder as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, same thing for what Alex and uh, Chris just mentioned also. Uh, for me, I usually will get feedback from my friends. So really close ones. I mean, friends, they are actually, they, they really don't mind um, giving you critical feedbacks and uh, helping you to listen out. At the same time, comparing yourself with the recordings that you have recorded yourself. And also find out what are the sound, the tone, that you like and you don't like, then that's when you 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 have a difference of, uh, I mean you are you have a clear mind of what you exactly you want, and from there you can exactly work towards it, yeah. So in short, uh, being able to hear yourself is very important, lah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, we hope that 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 answers the question. Uh. So the next one is directed to Christopher. So how do you slur from high to low notes smoothly? 
I think that's um, quite an advanced question. Um, <laughs> but firstly, I would think and I would recommend and suggest that you, we always like to practice um, lots of uh, harmonic series. I don't know if this is too difficult for you or you have seen, um, you've heard, you know, it goes something like that, you know, like. <laughs> something like that. Um, so if in relation to this question, how do you start from high to low easily? Usually what I would do is um, I, would, I would do harmonic series from top downwards with a tuner. And as, uh, as in relation with the previous question, also with good tone slurring down on the F horn side first. So imagine if I want to go from C, uh, a C to C. <laughs> So I would do this first and if a tuner of course and make sure that it's in tune and make sure that it is a good tone coming out from especially from the first C to the second C and then uh, over time what I would what you will get is this. That's the first thing, uh, first exercise that would help. The second one is to, as you do this exercise, make sure that you, make sure that the air travels and make sure that you don't push air from the top to the second, from the top, from the high to the low, no, make sure the air continue, continues and it doesn't stop. I think that's very, very important. And that's what most students would forget to do. They, they think that going down, you don't have to push air, but actually you, you need kind of, you kind of need more air to go, to dig down into the, 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 the lower note. Yeah. Do you agree that actually this exercise can be done from even the beginners? Yes. All right. Yes. <laughs> it should be done yeah. by the beginners, right? It should, it should be. Yes. Daily exercise. Yes. Now. Correct. Harmonic series is the most basic fundamental mm. thing of a French horn. Mm. Yeah. And it's not difficult because you literally don't change your fingering. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, moving on. Um, so for those again, uh, we see we have quite a few people joining us on Facebook Live. So a very good morning to all those who are just joining us. Hello. Okay, with us here, Luis, Christopher, and Alex. Um, will be sharing with us more on the French horn. Um, okay, so the third question, how to improve ambrosia? How to maintain ambrosia for long passages mm. or long notes? Uh, again, nice to, to Christopher. Um, this is a bit cliche, but the, um, I feel the <coughs> exercise that will help this is long tones. <laughs> but I feel that a lot of students, um, they always have a misunderstanding that long tones, you just do it blindly, right? But for, for, for me, with regards to this question is, um, as you do long tones, you have to understand what you're doing. You have to know that you are finding a balance point with air and ambusher. You also have to know that you have to do long tones with a tuner because most of the time when you're in tune, you have naturally, you have got a decent tone. So this question is also related to question one uh, earlier on as mentioned by Alex, right? So this long tones exercise actually is, is I feel it's very good, um, but you cannot do it blindly. Yeah, so I would suggest you get a tuner out. Okay, um, you know, start from a, somewhere from a, somewhere you're comfortable with, your, your most comfortable note, <coughs> just do a long tone, making sure that the embouchure um, doesn't, you know, in the UK, we call this spreading. Make sure it doesn't spread. Make sure you just keep it forward um, and keeping the air forward as well. Make sure you always breathe well as well. Don't just blindly just, um, you know, play without any intention. Yeah, so, and long passages of long tones, yeah. I think the first important exercise is long tones. As you, as my colleagues here will tell you, they are actually very important to do this. It's very important to, to do this on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think this actually, long tones can also, oh, sorry. Yeah, I think it also addresses on stamina, right? Yeah, when it comes to long passages, how to maintain your stamina for this. Yeah, Alex, you were saying? No, I was going to say that I think long tones not only improve stamina, but also improves tone, 
like you can do your experimental stuff during the long tones. But talking about stamina, I, for me, etudes, etudes have always helped me with stamina. Some, there are some etudes that are, because etudes come in many different levels, but there are some higher level ones that like, they really, really stay on the middle upper register of the horn. And that one can get really taxing, especially if you're on a downtime like now. So I'm doing a lot of that to try and keep up the, the if not naturally, I'll always just play things that are like maybe easier or things that I'm okay at, but like pushing myself. And I realized that attitudes make me have a clearer goal in mind. So I think attitudes are a good way to uh, improve stamina. Yeah. Louis, any inputs? Mm, for me, um, I usually do the really slow etudes. And then um, Coprash and Maxim Alphonse have actually quite a few. So they are actually a more quite available. They are available in IMSLP. So from there, actually, you can really lock on a lot of things like... Um, don't, don't even talk about uh, long tones. Uh, you can actually improve a lot on your rhythmic parts and really stable tempo and then knowing how to to sustain a note long enough and then not to sound too awkward so i mean of course back to back to even the the, the part where we always say record ourselves and compare to how exactly do you want to hear yourself yeah so actually this leads to the next question how long will you recommend actually practicing a day yeah, maintain the embouchure. Mm, okay, uh, for me, it depends. But uh, I try not to exceed a sitting more than 45 minutes. So, okay, um, it may have, I may practice about, let's just say, three to four hours a day. But uh, within one sitting, that means no distraction at all. Maximum is 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Because then, or at least even by 30 minutes time, I will lose my focus there. And then after, probably I will be going through motion and then not focusing on what exactly I want to improve. I'm all about quality over quantity when it comes to practice. Because I'm not that kind of horn player that can go on for hours, like just nonstop. Like, you know, there's some flute, like flute violin, you know, they can just go on forever. Horn, we cannot. It's a very sensitive part of our body, but especially me, I don't consider myself as someone who can <clears throat> go on for long hours. So I always, always like super intense, short practices that really focus on sometimes only one, one um, aspect of horn playing. And it can sound so monotonous. I'm sorry to my neighbors, but like I can spend half an hour just doing lit trills. And then that could be like the bulk of my practice. But the amount of quality practice I got in that half an hour exceeds like any four hour like subpar practice session that I've had many of. That's that's for me. So like sometimes my practice are like really short, but super, super focused. Like I don't do anything else except that one thing that I'm trying to fix in my playing. That's for me, yeah. Christopher? Yeah, um, probably similar to what uh, Luis and Alex says, um, just mentioned. Uh, you got you to gotta kind of categorize what you want to achieve within a short frame of time of 30 to 45 minutes. And you, you just have to work on that. I mean, you don't have to, I, I wouldn't drill myself into just one aspect of what I want to achieve. What I would do is, you know, I'll play a few notes and when I'm, I feel really uncomfortable, I'll work on it. And if it doesn't work, I would, I would try to play something free and easy again to, to kind of relax myself and not uh, make sure that I don't, I don't want to overthink into it as well. So I, I will try to find a balance point in what, in the things that I'm achieving. Yeah. So if students, if you ever find yourself like you, you, you're getting stressed and you're overthinking into a specific problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, if you're thinking about it, it's fine. But if you're thinking too much into it to the point that you can't get things done, then you should, you know, take a short break and practice something else first. And then when you feel comfortable and free at the chest area, especially again, and then you can go back and, and work on it again. 
Um, that's uh, what I would like to add on with regards to Louis, what Louis and Alex uh, mentioned earlier. I think this would be helpful. Mm. Yeah. Right. Thank it's you. all about finding what's comfortable for you, essentially, <laughs> while still maximizing efficiency. Yeah. Because everyone works differently, so it's all about finding what works best for you. Okay. Um, so actually, we have yeah a question on equipment that you all use. So how to decide what multi size to use? So uh, a musician is looking for something slightly bigger than Dennis Week 5 and maybe Louis, you are okay. you have more knowledge on this. Um, okay, uh, so for 5N Dennis Week, right? Okay, I'm looking at the chart right now. Um, it's actually a cup diameter of like 17.5, blah, 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 and a ball size of 4.6. Actually, 4.6 is a little big for beginners or rather uh, amateurs right now because... 4.6 is actually a really big ball, as in you. Okay, I don't know if you know what is ball. B O R E. Ball is the part where you see through your mouthpiece. This part, this little hole over here. So, okay, I give you a diagram. This this part is the ball. This is the inner cup diameter, where the outside part is called the outer rim diameter, and then. Okay, uh, this contour part, we call it the bite, B-I-T-E. Okay, so um, as to the question to decide what mouthpiece to use, uh, it really depends on your first, first thing, your teeth structure, this teeth structure, and followed by the lip size. So averagely for Asians, we try not to go uh, too small. I think... Um, Dennis Wick 5N is a little too small for the rim. Uh, maybe you can explore about like 18.0 inner rim diameter, which is uh, usual, usual mouthpiece sizes that we use are uh, Asia Merch Meat, for example, 10.5, 11, that would be a good starter. Um, uh, Asia Merch Meat mouthpieces are quite available in Singapore, uh, including JK as well. JK, maybe you can explore the numbers like um, one. Yes, one. But uh, I mean that again. Uh, I do face a lot of uh, secondary school kids that actually have very thin lips. So I usually task them to to play something smaller, which is about Schmidt eight five or Schmidt eight or uh JK, which is starting with the number two. Yeah. Then not everyone Angelina Jolie. Yeah, <laughs> so that that are those are the few quite accessible mouthpieces. I won't encourage using Dennis Wick. I mean, it's not a bad mouthpiece, but the ball itself is too big for any beginner to learn the instrument itself, and the the, the air that is required to put it through is really really a lot. So maybe look for something that is about four point three to four point two and below. Yeah, that, that will actually help a lot better. But okay, um, uh, throughout my, my, my years of playing, I realized one thing. Um, I always go back to Schmidt 11. It's not because of the, the how, how, how used I was, but rather I was comfortable with the bite. So like I said, um, this part, this part of the mouthpiece is really important. It can be sharp, it can be rounded, it can be flat. And this actually will affect how will uh, affect how the way you 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 even speak the note itself. So find something that is really comfortable for you, the rim, and then from there you can explore different cups and different ball size, and that will be easier for you to 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 test things out. Yeah. Any takes on uh, more pieces for both of you? Yeah, so actually I also wanted to ask, so what are your, actually your thought process and your minds for you guys when you all choose equipment like mouthpiece? Like what do you all actually look out for? Um, I look for sound first. Sound, then followed by response. And slowly after, I mean in the long, in the long term process is about stamina because sometimes different mouthpieces contribute differently on, on, your, on your stamina as well. So for thinner rims, 
for thinner rims that actually affect your 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 stamina. So if those that actually uses a lot of uh, pressure over here, you will actually cut the blood circulation over here on your lips. Thus, you won't be able to 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 to, to sustain long. But um, for thicker rims, there's uh, they provide a more cushioning effect. So technically, your stamina will actually improve in a sense. But that again is is is. At the end of the day, stamina is still is still a lot about the strength over here, and um, yeah, uh, that's 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 my top process at least the 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 small short version of it. Mm. Someone want to contribute? Yeah. Mm, for me, it's all about also the feeling, because if I, my teacher, uh, Jimmy has used to use this word. If you can taste the note. I know it doesn't really make sense on paper, but if you think about it, it's like when you put a mouthpiece to your lips and you are thinking of like a high, a high F, a middle F or low F, you already have this shape and feeling in your head. So for me, it's like if there are some mouthpieces where I just cannot taste more than 30, 40% of the notes and I know it's like, that's already not suited for me. Now I'm using also 18 mm inner diameter, but my bar is 4.5. But with this combination, I feel like I have a good balance of high and low. So for me, it's about feeling. And as long as it, I'm all about making life easier. So as long as it makes it easier for me to do what I need to do in a job, in a, in a group, in a concert, you know. Chris? Yeah, for me, uh, I mean, I'm using Schmidt 11 now. Um, before this, I was just actually using uh, Alexander 32 mouthpiece. So I had a lot of discomfort going down to the lower range because that mouthpiece was, I don't know, Louis, the, was it the, 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 the inside? The inside was a little bit sh shallow. Yeah, just slightly shallower. Yeah, for, for Alex 32, is a little bit shallow. So I have issues digging through to the lower range. And then immediately when I changed to a Schmidt 11, I, I, had, I had bigger range. So I think for me personally, that's how mouthpiece would affect me. Uh, with regards to secondary schools and from my years of teaching, most of you, if you do not have Schmidt 8.5 or Schmidt 11 mouthpieces, your mouthpiece would generally be too small. If you're using a Houghton or Yamaha mouthpiece, I would, I personally feel it's too small for, for all of you and you should yes. try to get some fundings to, you know, get Schmidt mouthpieces. For me, usually Schmidt mouthpieces are the general, it's generally the mouthpiece to go to for, for starters because you have got more space inside to vibrate the lips and you have more space for air to flow through the entire instrument as well. Whereas compared to a small mouthpiece, if you like the Houghton and the Yamaha mouthpiece, there, which is too small, in my opinion, if you use that those mouthpieces, you you feel like the air can't go through the, the instrument, and then you start getting a lot of tension, and your your shoulder starts coming up when you breathe, uh, which is not really recommended. So I would really recommend um, if you can, and you have got some money on your side, uh, do invest in a in a in a decent mouthpiece, uh, Schmidt would be a good start, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, are there actually any exercises that you all do or specific things that you all test out while trying out a mouthpiece? Let's say maybe like just test specific range or uh, excerpts from somewhere to like see whether this mouthpiece is suitable or not for you. Uh, I would, for me, I would, okay, Alex, maybe you go first. <laughs> oh, no, uh, I don't test excerpts straight away, but like the first thing I would do is usually like basic um, scales, and like I start from I start from a very very normal, comfortable, centered range where I know it would be like universally okay on all mouthpieces, which is just around middle C, middle F. <laughs> I start around there and then slowly I will, you know, chromatic scale up, check check how does the upper range feel, slowly go down, how does the lower range feel, and then I will test soft and loud. 
like the extreme soft, the extreme loud, just check the feeling. That's usually the first few things I do when I'm testing a mouthpiece. Yeah. Articulation also. I, I, I do check like, oh, slurs also. Yes. I do check slurs. Ah, this is what I, I used to like to do. As, I as in on a new mouthpiece and that also gives me like a fairly clear and fast fast idea of what it feels like because usually the first impression is one point and another thing people need to take note of when changing mouthpiece or trying new mouthpieces is that it will usually feel a little bit different after a week or so. So if you try mouthpieces, you should hold on to them for hopefully 10 days if you can. Um, reason being is that your, your lip, the structure, it changes and it grows into the mouthpiece. So sometimes what your impression is the first 15 minutes or the first day could slowly disappear or it could slowly change for the better. It could slowly change for the worse after a week. And there's no way you can avoid this except experience and a little bit of spending money. It's, it's, that's from my experience. So I have a couple of mouthpieces that I used a few weeks and I managed to find a secondhand seller. I mean, secondhand buyer for them. So that's, that was sorted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so since we are at Alex, right, I think um, based on Facebook Live, I think Mindy has a question for you. Mm. Yeah. Uh, on the stop horn thing that you always told her, is there anything you want to share? <laughs> ah. Oh, okay. This one you have to keep me in check on time because that one can be quite a <laughs> lengthy discussion. <laughs> I hope, I hope, but I don't know. I hope there are enough students watching at this point because I, if it's, ah, uh, anyway, will you save the video at the end? Yes, we will. Okay, yeah. good. Um, so, stopped horn, stopped horn. Um, what I always am talking about to like my peers and like colleagues is that there's a humongous, 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 humongous misconception about stop notes. Um, the misconception is that stop notes always go upwards. They always like... That's the misconception that when you play, if you want to play a C sharp stopped, you play a C natural. That's for like, I'm going to explain why this is wrong. If people do this, they're actually playing C and then D natural. That's actually what they did. But if you did a true stopped note, a true stopped note goes downwards from the top, from an open note. So if I were to do open C on open F horn and I did a stop note, that is the correct stop note that you're achieving from that fingering. So the misconception I'm talking about is that everyone's using the fingering that they think of semitone below. But what is actually a more in tune and more definitive fingering is actually the note from above. And it's not just any note from above. This one, it takes time to explain. But for example, if I want to do a, if I want to do a spacey stop note, the misconception is to play a B natural on F horn, okay? So I play a B natural on F horn. But if I cover my hand, that's technically where it goes. But what they're doing is... You understand? So, so you end up getting C natural, yes. But what you thought you were doing is playing a B natural. But the, the truth is you're actually playing a C sharp mm. on a... E harmonic series partial. That means like, this is a uh, F horn fingering two. This one. 
C sharp here. That's how you're getting your C natural. And the reason why this misconception needs to be talked about is because the intonation is not the most ideal. If I went by the logic that I'm using, um, and I were to get a more in tune C natural stop, I would use a C sharp fingering on B flat horn. So B flat horn two, three. Uh, I play the harmonic series first. So that's a C sharp, right? Okay, that, that's how I get my C natural. And there's no way to check now, but like with my tuner here, if I did the misconception fingering, which is B natural. It'll be very sharp. It's very sharp. And if I'm not sure how good this Zoom Facebook can hear it, but it's at least like 15 cents difference from what I'm hearing. This is the wrong one. This is the correct one. You guys can hear the difference? Yes. Okay, so if I did an open C, that's almost like the same intonation. But if I did the wrong one, you can hear it's wrong intonation. Then the misconception people are always have is that the stop note goes upwards, but it actually goes downwards. So if you're finding a lot of your stop notes are too sharp for whatever um, situation, whatever, whatever situation you're in, it's probably because you're using the wrong partial. And for anyone who doesn't understand this, it's more of the, the part I wanted to explain earlier is harmonic series. At this range that I'm talking about, yes, it's all by semitone. But when it goes deeper into the horn register, it's easier for me to demonstrate than, than explain. So I'm going to use uh, concept F harmonic series, just F horn open on French horn. Notice the distance between the open note and the stop note. do the math correctly, it goes down all the way to a semitone above the partial below it. I know it sounds like a lot, but if you think about it, it goes down to a semitone above the partial below it. If this is too much, I'm more than happy to explain on a more <laughs> simplified version out of this. I should make a video, but this is a huge misconception that I'm always talking about with whoever I can share this with. I think Lewis and Shen, uh, Lewis and yeah. Chris remember this from January, December when we last met. Fuck no. <laughs> yeah, so that's what Mindy was referring to. And um, it's it probably needs deeper and more concise explanation with diagrams and scores for easiness. So if you if anyone watching does not understand it now, I'll, I'll think of writing a small <laughs> particle. And just reach out to Alex personally, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm very accessible on social media. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alex. All right. Uh, Mindy, I hope uh, that answers your question. And I think you can always easily get in touch with Alex. Yeah. <laughs> no, she, knows, she knows how it works yeah. already. I, yeah. Okay, so moving on to uh, some of the other questions that we received. Uh, so uh, what are some recommended audition pieces for different grades? Maybe Louis, you want to touch on this? Um, okay, um, what do they mean exactly by different grades if I were to ask? I mean, different grades as in ABRSM grades or like um, secondary school, JC level? I, I would think more of the ABRSM kind of grades. Okay, yeah. so if um ABRSM um, if let's say I were to talk as in um, let's just say you don't have much money to buy scores like as in you don't have much money to get original scores, uh, at the looks of it um, 
it seems like only core brush, even maybe Maxi Alphonse. As in, okay, this, this core brush and Maxi Alphonse are etudes. And these two person wrote a pretty amazing uh, etudes for Horn. And for Maxi Alphonse, uh, they have like um, six books and ranging from the easiest all the way to the toughest one. Uh, I would recommend starting from there uh, because they are really um, nice lyrical passages from, from all these um, etudes itself. So I wouldn't recommend pieces like um, Strauss, Mozart yet. I mean, unless you, you are of a certain level, of course, um, but try not to touch these um, pieces that people actually know. So like, um, for example, Mozart, uh, Strauss, Concertos, when people hear it for audition, we be like, ah, this piece I know. And then if you play something wrong, people be like, uh, okay, you know, that kind of thing. Like, like try to get a, a, a piece that is comfortable for you first. Um, something that is, um, you can manage, but at the same time, you can push your limits. So um, for me, I will usually uh, use things like um, attitudes for, I mean, at your level, the, the kind of auditions, I will, I will recommend that. Um, not any classical and romantic pieces at the moment, like solo works, as far as possible. Sorry, which grade are you talking about? I mean, if you are making all these recommendations. Um, actually, if you were to look at uh, ABRSM, right, from grade five to grade eight, actually they do need required, they do require you to play uh, attitudes. I mean, if I'm looking at ABRSM, um, at least C itself is actually attitude stuff. So yeah, you can actually, I mean, all of them actually do have, yeah, all of them have core brush. And if I'm not wrong, um, Trinity Music uh, graded exams, they use uh, Mixed Elf fonts as well. So these two are very good books for attitudes. And that's, that's, one, that's where you can, can take things from. But um, if you really want something more lyrical, as in uh, more uh, nicer on the ears to, uh, to, to, to per se, you can actually try that book from, where, where, where's that book? Yeah, it's called The Principal Horn. Um, it's, it's printed by ABRSM. So it's like rearranged pieces. But then again, try to stick to uh, original horn works first, like um, attitudes, that would be great. What's considered actually a good piece for an audition? I mean, should it be like uh, contrasting within the work itself? Should you challenge, find challenging for, you, uh, for yourself to practice? Um, so what, what is considered good for you guys? Mm. Can I, can yes. I add something to that? Yes. Um, for choosing pieces at any level, like I, when I mean any level, I mean from your secondary school applying for direct school application into band for JC, for any level from there all the way upwards to a high level um, student looking for a job. If you have choice pieces, I always believe in balance, a balance of what you can show versus something that is, um, let me rephrase that, a balance between it being comfortable within your capabilities, yet challenging you and showing something more virtuosic. It always has to be a balance. I always think that there's no point if you're choosing something so impressive, wow, you're, like, wow, you're playing this amazing concerto, but you end up doing it to like a 25, 35% of performance standard, you know? Yeah. Then for me, there's it's as good as not playing the piece. So what I've I mean I've made that mistake tons of times before, and what I've learned from it is like, if you can do something that's a little bit more in your capability, but you can do it to an 80, 90 percent um, performance standard, that's so much more effective um, than showing the jury all your weaknesses, as compared to something that you're really confident. I mean, you also don't want to go to the other side of like playing something that's too easy for you. 
that one is is a you know that people will think oh he's playing it safe but something is like you can discuss with your peers and your teachers like what's something that's within my capability yet still pushing me that 10 20 percent of challenge you know and then you balance it from there you're feeling you want to challenge more and you're confident you can get it into a good 80 90 percent standard by the end then yes choose that but if you're not confident you have to manage your time and then you know you move it down the line a bit to something a little bit more within your means there's no shame in that i always believe in simple pieces pl- being played beautifully as compared to like crazy amazing famous pieces played you know yeah that's my take on choosing repertoire at any level of your your career Yeah, Chris, you would like to share your experiences? Well, they have almost covered everything already. <laughs> but what I can add on is, uh, you know, many years ago when I was auditioning for certain school, um, what I did was I picked a piece with regards to the technique that I was working on. So I was working on breaking through a certain range. Um, and I, of course, I was using harmonic series as well. So I used a specific piece that um, that helped with whatever I was working on as well. So, you know, I was simultaneously, I was doing music and technique. So I think that was really helpful to me. And uh, that was what I was working on at that current level. And I think um, with regards to students, if you are working on a certain technique at a certain range or a certain area of, of, of a breakthrough, you could um, actually pick a piece that you think might help and then in this way you don't think so much about technique but you could actually use music and the air and the momentum of the music itself or the rhythmic momentum of the music itself to to help you improve on your technique so in this way it becomes a win-win situation you you get you kill two two oh, sorry i mean two birds with one stone that's what i meant yeah so maybe that could uh, could be helpful I yep. think some pieces, if we're talking about the di- exact pieces, right? Like something we mentioned the other day was uh, Sanson. Sanson, Romance, the one in F major, not the one in E major. E major is much more difficult. Uh, the one in F major is a super, super standard, simple, straightforward piece for, I think, many students. Like it's in a comfortable range. I think the highest note is high F, right? Uh, and the lowest note, I, G, I think F or G. Is that G? So, I so, so. Mi do, so, la, ti la, so, la, ti do. I think the. Yeah, and yeah. It's a G in the middle part, I think. It's a high G, is it? Ah, okay. And then the lowest note is like. Ah, I forgot. Low G? No, I think B only. B only, yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, I, I would say a piece like that is like in a very comfortable range with that healthy amount of challenge maybe in the upper register that students can consider and another composer that we talked about that has many but not all of his pieces are good starting pieces for middle middle advanced is um a middle advanced students is uh franz strauss Mm. so franz strauss many of his works they are not too long so the stamina aspect is maybe taken care of a little bit but they are mostly slow and lyrical, so they actually help. They help a lot in general horn playing. Not it's nothing too virtuosic. It's nothing too over the top. It's all practicable and fun to practice because they're all like, they're all oh, what is he? Early romantic. Yeah, mm. early romantic, easy listening. So Franz Strauss, F R A N Z. Not Strauss. Richard Strauss. Yeah. Not Richard Strauss. The father. Fun yeah. fact. For who doesn't know, for who don't know, who, for who those who don't know, <laughs> I can't English. Uh, yeah, the father of Richard Strauss, Franz Strauss. He was a horn player. He was the horn player. Yeah. And more fun fact: Richard Strauss pieces, a lot of them were written after what he heard his father practice. So imagine if your father does a random warm up and then you write an entire symphony on that. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag held on Laban. Jibo way works, la. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, all right. So uh, moving on. Uh, oh, it's back to Alex again. So any tips to hit high notes more accurately without mispitching? <laughs> <laughs> I also want tips for that. <laughs> no, um, uh, yes, I have a two or three, I have two or three exercises. Yes, uh, maybe the third one we'll talk about is the Philip Farkas one. Mm. So the first two ones is much much more simpler and much more accessible. And I hope I can do it after talking. So you need. A metronome for this. You must have a metronome easily accessible all times. Usually I put it to Kochiko 60, which is like one second. And oh, yeah, I have to explain. What I basically do for this exercise is all right, I pick one note. If it's something in the slightly uncomfortable range, starting from maybe high F, high F is where it's like a break where people start to, oh, that's a high note. and versus comfortable note. So maybe I start from high F. Um, usually I would just play F, rest, rest, rest. Again, rest, rest, rest. And this is like the basic version of this um, exercise. So it'll be something like this. Literally just like that. For as many times, I mean, of course, there's many varieties you can do to this exercise. At some points, I wait 16 beats. Like I literally play one and then I have 15 beats of nothing. And then after 15 beats, I come in dry and like with no testing. And then you have to, half the time, it'll be. That will happen. But that's what you're practicing for because you can't practice accuracy by constantly playing. It's too easy. It's, if you're just going, you know, it's too, it's too you, you feel every note before it happens. What you, want to chat, what, what you want to practice is being able to come in from nothing, which I think is super, super difficult and important as horn players. So you do that exercise and then you, you change the note. Two, three, mm, etc. And even now, I'm still doing this exercise even at the slightly higher registers, you know. I'm not going to do that now. But <laughs> um, yeah, that is one exercise that I think really, really helped me in my... This started in diploma years, like 17, 18, 19 years old. Um, another one is a little bit more fun I actually did this with some of my classmates. Shout out to Brian, Mindy. Um, like we would do the exact same exercise, except the friend would call out the note for you. Like right before you need to play it. So literally, we can't do that now. There'll probably be a lag time. <laughs> but someone will like, F sharp. G sharp. You know what I mean? And that's like a fun version that I used to do because the, un the less preparation time you have, the harder it is. But that is what helps you improve accuracy because accuracy is not about having like, you know, if any of you, Lewis and Chris can help me phrase this better. Um, yeah, the, the, the predictability is the, the factor. Like if you know exactly what note you're going to play, of course, it'll be easier. If you don't know what note you're going to play, it'll, it'll challenge your accuracy to like really find it on the, on the dot. And then when you put it into a practical context, like in an orchestra or wind band setting or solo piece where you have like eight bar rest, sometimes 50 bar rest, and you have to come in so confidently on a, on a high note that's like easily mispitchable. I think this kind of exercise helps you with that. Yeah. So maybe Lewis or Chris, you guys can talk about the third one, the Philip Farkas, because I, I don't really have it with me now. Uh, okay, um, the Philip Farkas one, right, um, is by the, I mean, he wrote this book on the art of French horn playing. So on page, uh, exactly page 69, um, the number, okay. Uh, 
there's this uh, exercise uh, to develop really clean and accurate uh, attacks. So like, I mean, I can I I can show you because it's on my computer. So like the first note is an F, then the next note is a B, and then followed by uh, an octave close to an octave higher, which is an A flat. So you, you can see the intervals over there is really not the common ones. So uh, it's, it's really good to, to, to practice the accuracy over there. I mean, uh, I once in a while use this to the extent to what uh, Alex even say, I, instead of uh, one chord chart and uh, three, three beats rest, I put it to a longer rest, maybe two bars or three bars or even four bars as well. So that's how we really, really practice on accuracy. And of course, having a metronome with a tuner, you'll be great. Sometimes you don't know, you don't even know that you might even play a wrong note. I mean, especially for uh, younger players. Yeah. How important is uh, actually mental preparation when it comes to accuracy for horns? Uh, inner hearing. This is super, super inner. Yeah, exactly. That's one thing I, I, I didn't mention. Inner hearing. I think we need to define what's inner hearing. So inner hearing to me is the ability to hear the note that you want to play before you play it. It's not perfect pitch because anyone can have inner hearing. So of course, someone with perfect pitch will have this part nailed down. Like if you want to play a high G, you already know exactly what the high G sounds like. And if you get it or not, you, you'll know you're wrong or correct. But inner hearing is something that I think can be easily trained with determination. Um, one thing that I actually told some of my students in the past was that inner hearing is about connecting your ear with whatever you're singing in your head to whatever you play. And one small exercise that I used to teach my students was to be able to do a scale, a simple scale, but you play only the alternate notes and you sing the rest of the notes. You have to start slow and with a tuner. I'll, I haven't done this in a while, but this is what it's like. Start slow, up and down the scale with a tuner. And usually, what I've noticed when I observe students is this is what happens. That is the sign of your, your, in, your inner hearing was not well prepared before you actually sang the note. So what this exercise is doing is, of course, the horn, the horn notes that you're playing will help you create like a frame. And then you singing the notes is forcing yourself to hear the next note that belongs in the scale. If you end up going, you didn't, you didn't prepare well enough, but if you prepare well enough, you understand? So I promise you, this does not require perfect pitch, okay? Because you're getting the, the relative notes, the related notes to find your, the next note already from the horn. Yeah, so for me, this is what one can do to train inner hearing. Don't do the exercise fast, only slow. Yeah. Okay, uh, Christopher, you got anything to add on to hitting high notes more accurately? Mm, not really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. Maybe then we'll just move on to a question that's directed to you. Uh, how to steadily glease from low to high notes. Right. So this is, again, um, well, you know, I would really recommend the harmonic series again. So again, just now we did from high to low. So now we want to do from low to high. Right. I, what, I, what I would do is so for example, a lot of people have got, you know, in a lot of these uh, wind band repertoire, you have got tai kind of thing, right? So when I was much younger, I, I also had issues that I, you know, I, I couldn't do it myself. 
so how I trained myself was, you know, it was really, really quite boring and it's really quite about the same thing, right? So, you know, yeah, let me just show you. So what I would, what I do every day is just. so on and so forth. So you cannot use the harmonic series to, to build on that. Because if you can do slow with all the notes in between, eventually when you do it fast, you 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 kind of, I mean, you, you do have a little dirt. That's the whole point of having a, a, of doing a glissando. You want to have those notes in between. So if you can do that slow with good air support, um, eventually you will be able to do the, the entire gliss, right? And, and the other common misconception about students is that you you always only aim for the high note. Um, for me, I think the, the the high note would definitely be able to you everybody would be able to hear the high note, but the low note is usually where people is, is you know it's less audible, so people can't really can't really tell where you're coming from. And to me, with regards to air, and I'm sure if you if you aim for the first note with you know healthy air, healthy support, uh, healthy sound and healthy tone on the first note, usually the higher note would take care of itself. Yeah, most students don't aim for the first note and the low note and therefore you, you don't get stability from here and then when you hit the high note, uh, you, know, bah, ah, you know, it tends to happen that way most of the time. Yeah, so I would, I would recommend the, the exercise, the harmonic series exercise again. I think that's really helpful for a lot of things, uh, although it, it might come across as a little bit dull and boring for, for students especially, yeah. Do you recommend the same exercises uh, to increase your range? I mean, if someone's looking to increase their range. Yes, um, but for range, you have to be a bit more specific. Uh, if, you, if you want to increase, I mean, of course we have to always start with the middle range where you are most comfortable with and then you slowly build up and build downwards chromatically. So let's say my comfortable range is C to C and I want to go to C sharp because that's where the break point is for, for most students. So what I would do is, you know, something like this. To, to kind of chromatically go Upwards, bit by bit, and when as as you do this exercise, also it is it is very important to uh, make sure the ambusher stays. Uh, it don't change so much, don't move so much. Try to you know the corners should be firm and try to really really maintain a stability. Yeah, try to maintain stability in in all that you do. I think that's very important. In in this way, you slowly you can slowly chromatically expand your range. Uh, if you want to expand low range, you can also use the harmonic series on the F horn side. So usually, uh, okay, I'm, going to, I'm just going to start from the C again. So usually, it's... and then you slowly go downwards and downwards. And of course, going, um, building the range downwards is also another, it's a completely different technique and uh, it requires a lot of guidance, I would say, for, for secondary school kids because most of them, they, you know they do funny, funny, funny things after a while, so it's important that your teachers you should you should work this out with your teachers and make sure that you you know exactly what you're doing when you need to dig down into the notes at the in the lower in the lower register, yeah. But yeah, my point about the harmonic series exercise that's that's really really important, and also don't forget to do this with a tuner. So when you go up and go down chromatically, you can look at the tuner and see and adjust accordingly with whatever you need. Yeah. Any inputs from the rest? Lewis, you have? I have a little bit. You, you go first. Okay, so like to add on to Christopher's exercise about uh, slurring, one exercise that I found useful in earlier years <laughs> was the, the ones where you you do a, a chromatic scale, but you always go back to the first note. I 
Ça tu vois Etc. But um, the the reason this exercise is is good for me is because sometimes when I'm doing a scale upwards or a slur to a higher note, I, it's like what Chris said. We always forget where the note came from, the centering of the lower note. Mm. So, so I feel like this exercise really helps you center, like keep your ambition centered and grounded, so to speak. Like it's coming from like the same source. And it works both ways. I also use this a lot for slurring downwards, especially in towards the low register. And going as far as you is as you can while expanding your range. Another thing that helps with range expansion, um, this one was something. I forgot. I forgot who I heard it from. But same thing, upper and register. If you just flip it around, it's the same thing. One is uh. So let's just say, if high F is your most comfortable note, um, and you're trying to strengthen your F sharp and G natural, this is actually similar to the exercise that Chris did. But this one, the 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 only difference in this in this exercise is that the dynamic will actually help with the strengthening of the embouchure. So usually. Uh, I'm not sure how this will come out on the zoom, but it's about 40 to 40 simo. And then next one. So the point of it is that I'm already using a lot of my air in the first five, six, seven notes. And if you still have enough air and strength in your ambition to change to that that's where the real um, training is happening. So if you're focusing on that part, because uh, I'll show you, if, if I did it in a mezzo forte, I still have enough air. And the point of it is you want to be able to get that strength. So sometimes when you do the extreme soft and the extreme loud, that's when the hardest points are. goes for low and I still do this once in a while That's what, like, I think it's all about finding the security in the double forte because once once it's once your ambition is strong in an in a wider aperture when you play in the mezzo forte it will be easier I don't know how did the exercise come across on the Zoom. Did it? Yeah, not too bad. Okay. Yeah. That's that's all I have to add on from on Chris exercises. Yeah, I think so far is is they are they are the they are the essential ones lah actually. Hmm. Okay. So we are at the topic of practicing, right? Uh, maybe y'all can share with uh, everyone what are some of the good warm ups that you, you guys do some of your practice routines hmm. my routine uh, actually it, it, it differs daily so um okay um when I when uh so okay for for example today because um I don't feel good on my lips so I, I haven't seen me do any playing yet but um if I can, I try not to do anything too loud first. So, so when I feel that I have like um, stiffened lips or rather, or uh, lips that don't feel like is 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 um reacting well enough, I try to do something really light, like um maybe start from the middle C. And I I I start as simple as possible. So maybe do a scale thing, and then um. From then on, then do a semitone outward. I try not to go anything above uh, forte. So really focus on the touch on the lips itself. 
and getting the lips to flow. Um, another exercise is I would like to do with um, my mouthpiece is just buzzing. So just buzzing do re mi fa so do re mi fa so and then changing key. And then um, other other performance aid stuff that I will use is uh, I don't know if I, I mean I'm I'm not a uh, person that that's being sponsored by them, but I, I do 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 bought this thing recently. It's called the up sound. <laughs> okay, actually this thing itself um is quite amazing. Um from buzzing to into the mouthpiece versus buzzing into this thing itself uh actually give a little more closer to um the horn resistance. Um and actually it helps me to get the day warm up easier. Yeah, I mean this is my take at least. But um of course Routines itself, I don't really have much routines, but um, I will, I will differ on basically on the day itself of how I feel that day and then to, to get my chops going and then as fresh as possible. Even though I know it's a bad day, I try to make sure the bad day is not as bad as how people assume it is. Yeah. Maybe someone want to try? Yeah, so, you want to share? so for me, um, routine, I don't also have, I also don't have a kind of routine set, but uh, there were times where I've had very, very heavy concerts and this, it, it, it really helps when, I mean, you know, it depends on the situation. If you've got really, really heavy concerts and then you, you have to, you have to add different things into your routine you do every morning for your warm ups. For me, if I had a very heavy day of playing, the next day, what would happen is your upper chest and your entire body would be very stiff, especially in the morning. Your lip would definitely be a little bit sore, a little bit thick. Uh, this is where I feel the air really, really helps. So for me, what I would do on these mornings, and you know, sometimes heavy concerts can get a little bit uh, stressful when you're playing first one, especially. So, so when, you, when you're a little bit stressed, you need to let the body be more free and more relaxed and only air would help, I would think. So I would always come early in the morning, you know, eat, a, eat an apple and, and drink some coffee to wake myself up a little bit. Sometimes a run would help too, a uh, moderate run, not like 6, 6, 6, 6, 6 km or something, but maybe like 2 km, just a short run would help too. Um, but what really helped was uh, I would try to do some breathing exercise. So I would breathe in four, breathe out three, breathe in four, breathe out two, breathe in four, breathe out one. And then I uh, inverse it, I sweep it around. Uh, so I'll breathe in four, breathe out three, sorry, breathe in four, breathe out four, breathe in three, out four, in two, out four, and in one, out four. So just maybe two sets of that exercise would already help your body feel more free and more at ease. And then the other thing is, um. Uh, I want to mention is that the, the point of warm ups, you know, you do warm up because you need to get warm up, you know, so you don't want to do crazy exercises. You want to do something that's really, really comfortable within your range just to get the blood flowing to your lip, uh, just to get your body and your air moving. Uh, yeah, so I, I usually just, you know, do very, very basic things. Um, in fact, I wouldn't even take my tuner out because I, I don't. You know, my main point is to just get the air going, you know, and not think so much and feel relaxed. So usually, you know, I'll just, uh, yeah, the usual, I would do this harmonic series thing. And, but I don't do this blindly, you know, I do this in a way that, that lets my air flow, you know, so I do it in a more free way, like, you know. <laughs> really, really relax, making sure the air is good, making sure there's a minimal tension at the chest, shifting all to the diaphragm area, and making sure you breathe in and out a lot, you know, not, not, um, not breathe, don't breathe shallow. Um, yeah, I think, I think that helps a lot because your main, the main point of having a warm up is to warm up. It's, it's not to do crazy things or crazy excerpts. And then usually what helps is after a warm up, I would do this for about 10 minutes, no more than that. You know, I'll go walk around the room or go do something else. Then I come back five, 10 minutes later and I'll do the same. And then your body will eventually in time start to warm up. 
you know, this is why they say that um, if you have a job, you know, if your rehearsal starts at 9.30, you should be there at 9, you know, to appear early to, to do some really basic warm up. And then you have some time to waste and, you know, to mingle around and then come back and do a little bit more warm up. And then by the time you start your first note at uh, 9 30, you, you, you know, you feel ready and you feel at ease and relaxed. Yep. That's what I would do. Alex, do you have anything to add on? Uh, just a little bit. Um, yeah, it's actually in line with what Lewis and Chris have said. So, at least for students, I, I noticed a lot that like, like when I'm going to teach, like when they're in front of me, they just pick up the horn and they start like bashing like harsh notes and like start practicing like things that, you know. So that for me, which I used to also have, is a very bad habit. Um, without proper warm up and just jumping straight into like loud, harsh, high playing, it could potentially injure your injure your lips. So in line with what Chris and Lewis mentioned, it's like you always start off with something that actually like pianissimo, piano, pianissimo, mezzo piano at most. Like my first three to five minutes, you don't hear anything more than mezzo piano or piano dynamic wise. Um, routine wise, I won't say I don't have a routine, but I have many like exercises but i don't do all exercises every day maybe let's just say i have a b c d e right maybe today i do a c e tomorrow i do b d f you understand so in some way that's a routine but it always changes depending on how i feel that day and i think as secondary school band students a lot of them including myself it's like we were not as sensitive as to how we were feeling that particular day it's like every day was the same you just play just play just play which I think that kind of needs to bring some light and awareness. Like you need to be a bit more sensitive to your lips so as to achieve like um, a, cl a clearer, clearer perspective of how you want to play. I don't know if I'm making sense, but like the more aware you are of it, balancing without overthinking, it's like then you're, you can consciously improve on things that you know you need to improve. But if you just start the day and just go smashing into the horn, it's like you're going to football practice. But even football practice, you still need warm-up, you know? You don't see people just running a marathon without proper stretching before that. So horn is exactly the same. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so in the essence of time, we'll do one last question. And that uh, it's coming from the Facebook Live. Uh, we have from Jie Yuan who's asking, uh, does you guys have any exercises to practice right hand technique? So I think it's uh it's pertaining to the different school of thoughts for hand position for the right hand. Uh, I thought like contemporary, like like. <laughs> mm. Mm. Who? Anyone wants to speak first? Or... Okay, maybe I can go first. Yeah, you can try. Yeah. Yeah, this is from my experience teaching, you know, um, so a lot of students like to do funny things. I don't know why. <laughs> so the first thing I've seen a lot, a lot of students, especially sec ones, right? They like to do this, you know, their right hand goes here and then they play. That's one. The other one, when they cannot get the notes that they want to get, they do this. They put the right hand here. And then they play, and then they ram the mouth, the whole horn into their face. Okay, right. There's a there's a good reason why the hand has to be in the bell. It's for intonation. It's for tone color. It's for a lot of a lot of reasons, right? So that's that's the usual problems that I see. The other problem that I see, which is, you know, these students are on the right right path. Uh, when when they play, they usually their hand usually cover the entire hole because they, you know, they get, I mean, some of them are quite small size, you know, sec one and then scrawny and all, and then the whole hand goes in together and they end up covering the hole, right? So this gives them a very, very stuck sound. Uh, the sound doesn't travel and the, you know, it, it causes intonation problems as well. So what, I don't know, personally for me, I don't know about um, other home players, I would, 
do the hand like this, you know, in a cut way, making sure that this whole thing is straight. And for me, I use this knuckle area and the thumb area, the, this bone over here, this, this whole platform area to support the, the horn in the bell. So here, I would go in the bell here, you know, and with regards to what Alan, uh, sorry, Alex mentioned earlier, you can also close to get the stop notes as well as open up. And when you're a little bit flat on the high range, you can also open up even more. Yeah, but but I would I would really you know keep this whole thing open so that you you don't really block the sound and and, and stuff like that. I think Alex has something to to add on to show. Yeah. Or oh, maybe Louis too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, like yeah I think because okay. Lewis and I we also discussed about it before. Like there's there's the so this is the ring, right? Where your hand goes in. Like this there are schools of teaching whereby the hand position is relatively quite 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 straight. And it's almost placed in the middle, a bit towards the right. Like what? Would you say two thirds, one third, Lewis? Yeah. So it meaning the back of the hand is not touching the bell. The entire bell is supported and the horn is supported just by that. That thumb and the pinky contact. Personally, I don't do this, but this is one. And this, maybe Lewis, you can talk about this version. I'll talk about the other one. Mm. So for me, mine is all the way to the wall. And my head is slightly curved. Just almost like this, like straight. Mine is slightly slightly curved and against the wall. So this, uh, both, both work. It just depends on the person. Mm. But the, the logic behind both is that you have to have enough opening to let the sound through. Yes, there's been a lot of talk about, um, oh, my hand is too small. I cannot do stop note. But I have met tiny, tiny, tiny horn players with the humongous sound and you, you know, and even a little bit might drop, but having met Sarah Willis herself, her hand is not large. But she can still hold such an open hand position and get such a closed stop sound. So it's all about finding that balance. You have to adjust your, your left hand and how you hold the horn, the balance. The balancing is all about experimenting where is the center for you while still maintaining an open sound. Too many people, too many students, they end up balancing the horn too much on the right hand, and then it goes into like this little bowl, like you're catching, what, I don't know what you're catching. And then it's like, it's just covering 90%, and then you end up getting this muffled sound. And it's like, that's another way, another factor you have to consider when you're talking about improving tone. Okay, yeah. So, um, okay, uh, back to me. Uh, for my pers hand position, it will be actually just, Two thirds, so one, one third, two third. I mean, some some of them can do do half, but uh, usually I, I I go about this. So, um, a lot of kids actually when I ask them to do that, they will, they will do this. Okay, just give me a moment. Okay, they will they will look at the hand position, and they'll be like, ah, okay, I got it. But when they put it back to the playing position, their hand will be this way. <laughs> so okay, this is something that they have to be aware of their wrist movements. So, when you ask them to open their hand, they need not to open their, 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 their arm like this. It, all they have to do is just to open this way. And for this itself, you can change a lot of things. Tone, color, intonation. There's a lot of things. And even, okay, um, I, you can say that I'm a lazy horn player. So, in fact, when actually I have slight intonation problems, I do this. I change the finger movement. When that finger movement, actually, I, I, I just move a bit, it will actually change slight intonation here and there. So if I, 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 when I'm moving the fingers, actually, you can't really see from, from the outside. Yeah. So that's my take for the hand position. Back to you, Clive. All right. So uh, as much as I would like to continue this, we will have to cut it short due to time constraints. So right. Uh, that concludes the first session of our online with the pros. So we hope we got most of the things you asked covered. So thank you once again to our three guests, Alexander, Louis, and Christopher for your time and your very valuable insights. <laughs> I believe all of us took away a lot from this session. 
So for all those who are still with us, please continue to join us for the next session of Online with the Pros at 12 p.m. on this same page as we continue with the next group of musicians from the saxophones. So thank you and see you. Saxophone? Bye. Yeah. <laughs> e flat horn. <laughs> Frenemies of the French horn. <laughs>